Today, I'm going to be giving you five steps to have the dinking consistency of Ben Johns. I'm also going to be giving you a bonus tip at the end, so stay tuned. So step number one is we want to make sure that we are locking our wrist up so it's cocked back, <laughs> like I'm showing you guys in this video, and that we're using our shoulder as a hinge, okay? We're not swinging from our wrist. We're not swinging from our elbow. We're not bending our elbow. We're just keeping a nice, straight, relatively firm hinge as we come through, okay? Our shoulder is staying relaxed. The rest of our arm is relatively firm. And then we have a grip pressure of about a three out of five, two out of five. It's pretty light, okay, but not too light that it's our paddle's falling out of our hand. So we're keeping it light and we're using that shoulder as a hinge, regardless of if we're doing a backhand dink or a forehand dink. And the reason that you want to do this is because it relaxes your entire arm and takes away any added movements that you don't need. Because if you end up bending your elbow as you hit and you're moving forward with your shoulder at the same time, your timing's going to be off. You're going to miss hit the ball a lot more. And it's not going to be consistent. And that's what this video is all about. You're not going to be able to consistently hit the dink in the same spot over and over and over again because you're changing it up each time. Maybe one time you're keeping your arm relatively straight. And by straight, I don't mean that you're not bending your arm. Just to clarify, I don't mean that you're not bending your elbow. You're just keeping your arm at the same angle throughout the entire motion. Okay, You're not bending it throughout or unbending it as you hit. That will cause inconsistency. Another big, a big thing that I see that I mentioned earlier is your wrist. So keeping it cocked <laughs> back, what regardless of if you're doing a forehand or a backhand dink, because if you don't, you're going to end up getting this wobbly fish motion. Okay, and if you have that, it's going to be extremely inconsistent because you're not controlling the ball well because your wrist isn't locked up. You're not controlling your shot all the way through. So make sure you keep that wrist cocked <laughs> and that you're hinging from your shoulder and you keep your arm on the same angle throughout the entire motion. Because some dinks are going to be up higher, so we're going to have to bend our elbow. But the important thing is that we hinge from our shoulder and keep our keep that angle the same throughout the entire motion. Okay, that brings us to step number two, which is shading. And if you haven't heard of shading, what it is is essentially is you and your partner want to follow the ball. So if you dink cross court, you don't want to stay out wide. So let's say your opponent hit the ball to you way out wide. You don't want to dink back cross court and then stay way out wide. You want to close towards the middle. And I don't mean you're going to hover in the middle and be directly in the middle of the court, but you want to be closer to the right side of your box. So for instance, let's say that you are dinking odd side to odd side. Whenever you dink cross court to the other odd side, you're going to come and hug the center line of your box. And the reason that this is called shading is because you're shading over the court. So you're making the court feel small for your opponents. And the only opening that they will have is that dink back cross court because you're covering the middle. You're reaching into the court, putting a lot of pressure on, reaching into the kitchen which makes it extremely difficult for them to be able to hit any other shot or keep it short enough in the kitchen. Chances are you'll also get a pop-up. Now, if your partner is dinking, let's take the backhand side. Let's take the, the odd side. For example, again, you're dinking cross-court with your opponent. Your partner is obviously on the right side. Your partner is going to shade towards the right. Okay, Wherever that ball is, that's where they want to be in alignment with. And then it's the same if they're dinking even side to even side. You want to stay in alignment with the ball. The reason for this is if you don't, you're probably going to get passed down the line if they choose to speed it up or even hit an aggressive dink down the line when your partner is dinking cross court with your opponent. So wherever that ball is, and an analogy that I like to use is I like to act like a string is connected to me and my partner and the ball. So if the ball moves to the right, we both shift or shade to the right. The reason that this will make you more consistent is because 
you'll be able to follow exactly where the ball is going. Whereas if you don't follow the ball, you're leaving openings in the court for your opponents to hit to, and then you're ultimately going to be off balance. Let's say that they dink, hit a more aggressive dink, or even just a basic dink into the opening. You're going to be off balance coming into the opening, and you're probably going to miss that shot. So if you can go to the place where the ball is going to be prior to the ball getting there, you're going to be a lot more consistent. Okay, step number three is an interesting one, and it's one that I have learned throughout time, and it's not something that's teached that's that's taught, not teached. Nibby nibby wah. Chum chimney, chum 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 woo. Hi. Kiano over door. Inasu. The chief says he has not understood the dialect you're using. <laughs> it's not something that's taught very often. And what it is is your off arm or your non dominant arm implementation. Okay, in each shot. So our non-dominant arm, a lot of the time with amateur players, what I'll see is their non-dominant arm, and mine's my left, will be just chilling by their side as they're dinking, as they're playing, and it looks, it doesn't look right, okay? What you'll see with pros is they're constantly using that non-dominant arm to their advantage. And so for this dinking consistency tip, what it is, is regardless of if you're hitting a forehand dink or a backhand dink, you want to lift your left elbow, as you guys can see in the video that I'm that I'm overlapping this with. But you're going to lift your non-dominant elbow up. And what that's going to do is put your paddle at the correct angle to be able to hit a consistent dink. So right as you're making contact, your arms are separating. So for a backhand, for instance, arms are separating. And then you're dinking, pushing forward, remembering that hinge, keeping your wrist locked. And moving that elbow back as you're moving forward into the shot. And then I'm not coming all the way up over my head with my elbow. Okay, it's nothing that feels unnatural. I'm just coming to about a 90 degree angle. My elbow is going to pop maybe slightly above my my rib cage because I'm hunched over, right, hitting that dink. So uh, what I'll challenge you guys to do is next time that you're watching a pro match, watch for their non-dominant arm and watch how when they're hitting a backhand dink, that non-dominant arm, so long as they have a one-hander, by the way, that non-dominant arm is going to come up naturally as they hit and all that's doing is it's giving them a consistent dink it's putting their angle of their paddle face in the correct position so they can consistently hit that consistent dink every single time on the forehand side it's pretty much the same as you hit you're just going to move that elbow into your rib cage okay as you hit you move your elbow into your rib cage what that's going to do is keep that consistency there uh, you're going to consistently have the same angle on your paddle face because it's opening your shoulders through the shot as you hit. So make sure that you implement the left arm. It's going to feel super awkward in the beginning. I've taught tons of people this, but after about, I don't know, a thousand shots of hitting it, it starts to feel natural. So just stick with it. Make sure that uh, you're putting it up as you're dinking. You're not putting it up prior because that makes no sense. You're not going to have a consistent dink because your body's not in alignment with the shot. So remember, we're separating as we're hitting. Okay, that that brings us to tip number five, which is an interesting tip. And this is something that I learned from my friend who's a senior pro. His name's Tom Tuller. Okay, and what he taught me was that for majority of your dinks, where you're just having a consistent dink, so these aren't aggressive dinks, more aggressive we get, the less consistent we're going to be. That being said, we don't want to just give people lollipops to dink, okay? So we want to get a good in-between of a consistent slash aggressive dink uh, so that, that, first of all, it's consistent, but also we're not just providing our opponents with something that they can easily speed up. So like I said, this tip came from Tom Tuller. What you want to do is make sure that the ball is traveling down as soon as it hits the plane of the net. So it's coming up. As soon as it hits the plane of the net, it's now traveling down. And it's super basic, super simple, but it's not something that we think about. But if we could do that consistently, where it starts traveling down as soon as it hits the plane of the net, our opponents aren't going to be able to get aggressive with that dink. Because we're going to, first of all, be keeping it low. But also, we're keeping it can in that consistent spot where we're aiming for the same spot over the net. So if we can get that consistent over and over and over again, where it's 
coming up. And then as soon as it reaches the plane of the net, it starts to travel down. We're going to have a consistent dink. So focusing on this in your drilling sessions, uh, as you're playing rec play, just consciously say to yourself in your mind, okay, I want the ball to travel down as soon as it reaches the plane of the net. And you'll be shocked at how much your dinking consistency goes up. The first time that I learned this from Tom, I was like, it's so basic, but let me, let me give it a shot. And my dinking consistency was unreal. And it wasn't like I was just giving my opponents lollipops at all because it's traveling down as soon as it reaches the plane of the net. But yeah, my dinking consistency shot way up. So that's a super important tip, making sure that the ball is traveling down as soon as it reaches the plane of the net. That will improve your consistency tenfold. Okay, that brings us to our final point, our bonus point. Um, so good on you for sticking around to get the bonus point. Proud of you. What the bonus point is, is we want to keep our paddle face facing where we want to go. And we just want to draw a line from A to B. And so what I mean by that is as we dink, okay, so we're keeping all other tips in mind, keeping that hinge, keeping our wrist locked. We're going to keep our paddle face facing our opponent, facing where we want to go. We don't want to roll it over, right, as we hit. That's going to be very inconsistent. The timing's going to have to be pretty near perfect to be able to hit a consistent dink. So I'm just keeping my paddle face open, and I'm pushing through the shot consistently each time. Now, if I'm hitting a topspin dink, it's quite a bit different, right, because I'm coming over the ball, so I kind of need to create that burger flipping motion, right, where I'm windshield wiping over the ball. That's a definitely definitely a more advanced shot, and it's just not going to be as consistent as if I just aim my paddle face where I want to go. Can it be very consistent, though, if I practice topspin dinks? And can it be? It's, it's definitely a more aggressive shot, yes, but never can it be more consistent than if I just put my paddle face towards where I want to go and push the dink over, right? So when we're, wanting, when we're wanting to get aggressive and when we have a good opportunity to be aggressive with the shot, that's when we would want to um, hit a topspin dink. Uh, that being said, only if we're drilling that, right? Only if we've drilled it prior, we've hit 1,000, 10,000 of these, we feel comfortable with it. Otherwise, rely on your consistency okay, and rely on your hands to be able to keep the ball in the kitchen. And then you'll see your opponents will become very frustrated because you're not popping anything up. They'll speed up a shot, so just be ready for it, and then you'll be able to counter it. If you guys need help with your your counter, check out my last how-to video. It's all about how to counter. It'll be able to it'll walk you guys through five steps to have an effective counter of always being ready and then being able to punch that ball back whenever someone chooses to speed up the ball at you to where they won't want to do it anymore. That is the bonus tip. The last thing is, if you guys want any of this merch, we're I mean, we're selling this off the shelves. It's been super, super fun. We came out with our merch. This is our podcast, Picklehead Podcast. This is my brand, Pickleball Playbook. Makes a PP. You got a nice little little ball on both the logos. If you guys want to buy this, I will leave a link in the description below for you guys. Also, last thing is, this bad boy just came out. I played with this in my... My last tournament, this was a couple weeks ago, almost, almost a couple weeks ago now. And it was a 5-5 tournament, ended up getting the W. So it's a testament to this paddle, a testament to me how amazing I am. I'm just playing. But it's a testament to this paddle. It, I, I really, really love it. It's my favorite paddle I've ever used. Um, I'll leave a link in the description below. You guys can get a $30, I think it's $30, uh, gift card, and you can use that at Selkirk. For anything else so what i suggest doing is buying the paddle then getting your 30 dollar gift card and then purchasing a hat or if you want to just use that towards your balance of buying a second paddle that's what i would do because i like more than one paddle just in case anything happens if i forget a paddle i always have another one in my bag ready to go um, but yeah absolutely love the control of this paddle it's 20 millimeters so it's definitely a control paddle but i still get crazy power from it that being said, I'm definitely more of a power player. I can produce my own power really, really well. So that definitely helps. Um, but I hope that you guys enjoyed this, and I hope that it's been helpful. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to ring that bell. Uh, I upload a new video every single week, 
And the last thing is just comment below with anything that you guys want to learn about. Uh, and the most commented about subject will be what I talk about next. So appreciate you guys watching and I'll see you on the next one.